Okay, this video is a book review. The book is Pathophysiology of Heart Disease by Leonard Lilly. He's like the chief of cardiologists at one of the Harvard hospitals, Brigham and Women's. This is the current edition, seventh edition, copyright 2021. And I can very quickly tell if a book is good or a joke by just looking at the index. And you go right to the index of this book. And how long is the book? Let's see, it's about 490 pages. So plenty of pages to get to the point. It lacks the names of virtually all the big names who've done the useful research about atherosclerosis. There's no Blankenhorn, no Donison. Blankenhorn, you know, showed in his paper that all types of fat increase the risk of coronary artery atherosclerosis. No Donison. He did the paper that showed the incidence of hypertension in blacks in Kenya was zero and 1,800 consecutive admissions. No Esselstyn, the great pioneer of reversing heart disease. No Friedman. Friedman and Rosenin looked at high-fat diets under a microscope showing how they occlude small arteries. No Kell and Pretorius, they're the ones that figured out amyloid clotting and postprandial endotoxemia. No Peter Kuo, who did the earlier work on sat fat. Friedman and Rosenin did the work on uh, polyunsaturated fats like omega-6 cooking oils. No uh, Kempner, who was reversing heart disease, <laughs> reversing EKGs, reversing congestive heart failure back in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Nothing about Moore, the guy who de dedicated his whole life to re uh, researching hypertension and showed the major effect of a high-sodium diet. Uh, nothing about longevity populations like Okinawa, the Tatahumata, Simani, Yanomama, who avoid hypertension and atherosclerosis. Wouldn't it be useful to know about them? Uh, nothing about Dr. Ornish, uh, nothing about Nathan Pritikin, William Roberts, uh, Gregory Sloop, the best atherosclerosis researcher in the world there, currently Gregory Sloop. Um, Roberts, by the way, did the autopsies on all the hearts and patients who died from myocardial infarctions and arrhythmias. Pretty useful information. Okay, nothing about these major basic concepts, the concept of amyloid clotting from postprandial endotoxemia, especially that figured out by Kellen Pretorius, nothing about atherothrombosis, you know, the theory of sloop that explains everything. That's what atherosclerosis is. It's a blood clot. You won't find that in this book. Nothing about bridging molecules, overcoming the zeta potential, nothing about glycocalyx. Actually, they do talk a little bit about the endothelium. They don't use the word glycocalyx, but I think it's pretty important to use the word glycocalyx. Um, nothing about rouleau formation, blood sludge, blood viscosities, not in the index, uh, vasovasorum theory of Haverich, Dr. Haverich, nothing about the Winkessel effect, overcoming the zeta potential. Please, these are the basic concepts. I don't recall seeing anything in there about endothelial precursor cells, EPCs. We're talking basic. I couldn't give an introductory lecture to first year, to first year medical students without going over this stuff, okay? This is really basic stuff. So what this means is this is the definitive textbook. This is the big shot book that people will, will quote and look to for understanding uh, atherosclerosis and coronary disease. There's no mention of the history of coronary artery disease research. There's no mention of nutrition. Actually, there's one brief mention. There's only one time where they, they let their guard slip and they say on page 134, I put all the page numbers here so you can look this up for yourself. Elevated serum LDL may persist for many reasons, including a high fat diet. <laughs> so they do have high fat diet in that one little word and they always do it in a way that people don't get it, okay? Um, the book has nothing about epidemiology. I mean, this is basic stuff. You look at these, you know, plant-based populations. They don't get coronary artery disease. They don't get hypertension. You know, they could die at 80 years of age and not have any hypertension, okay? And there's no, this book makes it impossible to cure a patient of hypertension or coronary artery disease, um, there's very poor understanding in this book of coronary artery disease and of hypertension. So again, it means they cannot cure anybody. This is like going before the gates of hell where Dante and Virgil in the Divine Comedy saw the sign above the gates of hell that said, abandon hope, all ye who enter. You know, you go to these guys and these guys are the best of conventional medicine. These are the smartest guys. These guys are all in the top 5% of their class. They are the big dogs in uh, the world of conventional medicine, okay? And that's what I'm saying is a joke. Somebody could go on the internet and watch a couple Esselstyn videos and, and a couple, you know, Richard Moore videos and stuff, and they would know more about, and Dr. McDougall, they would know more about curing a patient of hypertension and coronary artery disease than a doctor who trained for, 
you know, 14 years and subsequently, you know, was in attending at one of the major hospitals, Ivy League hospitals, okay? That's what I'm trying to say is conventional medicine calls itself the gold standard, but in reality, it's a joke. Their cure rate is zero. <laughs> Whereas low-fat vegans, you don't even need to go to school. Just any anybody who wants to learn can sit down and watch a couple of videos for a couple of days, and they will know more about atherosclerosis and coronary artery, uh, how to cure it, than these guys do, okay? That's true. And what I'm saying is this is like writing a book about football with nothing about passing or a book about basketball with nothing about dribbling free throws, three-pointers, or like writing a book about baseball with nothing about pitching and catching. It's ridiculous. It's beyond stupid. It's a joke, okay? Now here, I'm just going to show you some quotes from the book. 90% of hypertension, hypertension patients have blood pressures that are elevated for no readily definable reason and are considered to have essential hypertension. So essential hypertension means they don't know the cause. It's idiopathic. And we know what idiopathic means. It means the doctor's an idiot and the patient's pathetic. Okay, there's the page number, 333. Next quote. There is strong support for the role of heredity in essential hypertension. Okay, now that's a bullshit statement. The reason why I say it's a BS statement is because what they're trying to do is tell you it's genetic. Because as soon as you label a disease genetic, what you're really saying between the lines in conventional medicine is there's nothing anybody can do. It's just genetic. You got to take our medicine. And the evidence that they will cite for hereditary components, they'll say, look, both of the identical twins have it. Siblings are more likely to get it. Well, no shit. That's because they both eat the same diet. Duh. Okay, that doesn't mean it's a genetic problem. Okay, now look at the next line here. This is the typical way that uh, students, medical students, residents, fellows are bullshitted, and, and, and public is too. The next line here. Hypertension has been linked to poor access to health care and to low socioeconomic status. Okay, now why do I say that's bullshit? Well, like I said, in the Kenya study of, in the Lancet Journal 1929, down to 1,800 consecutive admissions with zero hypertension. They're a bunch of poor people, the Kenyans in Africa, okay? They don't have any hypertension. All these populations, the Okinawans, the Yanomamo, <laughs> the Tadahumara, they are poor people. The Tadahumara are so poor, they don't own cars. The Yanomamo don't own cars. Most of the Okinawans would walk to their field where they grew their food. These are all poor people. So it's not low socioeconomic status. They're all poor. It's not poor access to health care. All of those people are poor. It's not genetic. It's just because they eat the same diet. So what I'm trying to say is they try to hook you on this bullshit. Well, it's due to aging and genetics poor access to health care. They're better off with no access to health care with these guys. All they've got is pills. They don't know anything about diet, okay? So this is all bullshit. And they'll say the same thing in other books about diabetes and other books about, uh, you know, uh, hypertension. I, I'm just telling you, it's, it's bullshit, and, and you need to know that. Okay, let's look at some more quotes here. Elevated insulin levels may contribute to hypertension. Okay, elevated insulin contributes to hypertension. Well, what causes elevated insulin? Insulin resistance. What causes insulin resistance? Main thing is high-fat diet, okay? That's why these high-fat diets and the people who promote them on the internet are a joke, okay? All types of dietary fat will, will cause insulin resistance and will lead to elevated insulin. Okay, then here's, some, here's something really interesting. This is good. And they do, they do mention, I thought this was a good point. This is on page 335. They say elevated insulin levels will cause increased sympathetic activation. And they also will stimulate uh, vascular smooth muscle hypertrophy. Okay, well, why is it a big deal they cause increased sympathetic? That means they have a sum of an effect that mimics psychological stress, increased sympathetics, sympathetic autonomic nervous system. That means it will lead to increase in cortisol and catecholamine. Okay, well, you don't want that. That makes you fat, that makes you hypertensive, that can predispose to anxiety, that can predispose to a decrease in impulse control. So what am I saying here? This also helps partly explain high-fat diets cause elevated insulin, cause increased sympathetic activation, that means fight-or-flight mode. Maybe that's why the keto carnivore, paleo, keto, um, low-carb types are such jerks on the internet. They're so rude and impulsive and aggressive because they have elevated sympathetic autonomic nervous system. They're in fight or flight mode because if they have a clue, they realize their paleo, keto, carnivore, low carb diets are a joke, as is the meat eating Mediterranean diet. A joke. It doesn't cure patients of coronary artery disease. Okay, um, what does he say? Smooth muscle hypertrophy may be caused by a direct mitogenic effect of insulin. Okay, mitogenic effect means it causes cells to replicate. 
Now, why do I think that's funny? Because what you're really saying here between the lines is insulin is a growth factor causing cells to replicate. And the indirect implication is, well, maybe that causes mitogenic effects on other cells. Maybe that causes cancer to grow. So what you're sort of saying here between the lines is you're implying that a high fat diet will cause hypertension, atherosclerosis, and it's known to cause diabetes, and it causes mitogenic effects, meaning it elevates things like insulin-like growth factor. So it causes increased cancer. Okay, so what I'm trying to tell you is medical students, residents, fellows, attending physicians, they never realize it from reading these books. But once you know nutrition, you can see the truth buried within their abstract words. Okay, now here's another thing here. He says obesity itself has been directly associated with hypertension. Well, what causes obesity? We know that the higher the percentage of calories from fat, the fatter the population gets. So the fatter the diet, the more fat you get. That's number one. Number two. We know that processed food makes people fat. Well, gee, what's in processed food? There's a lot of oils. There's also a lot of MSG and MFG to get people to overeat by making it hyperpalatable. Those are other things that cause obesity. And we're not going to get into it, but estrogenic chemicals also lead to obesity. Those are some things. Being sedentary, lack of sleep, causing elevated stress. Okay, uh, he continues. Research has identified several key components that contribute to atherosclerotic inflammatory processes, including endothelial dysfunction, yeah, but why do you have endothelial dysfunction? Maybe it's because the high-fat diets cause the neutrophils, the white blood cells, to release more MPO, myeloperoxidase. I gave an entire lecture on that. And the MPO, myeloperoxidase, is very cationic, meaning it's positively charged. Therefore, it overcomes the zeta potential of the glycocalyx, meaning the negative charge of the glycocalyx, the endothelial lining. And it collapses down the antithrombotic molecules on the endothelial glycocalyx. Once those are collapsed down, the antithrombotic glycocalyx is collapsed down, then the positive molecules like vascular cell adhesion molecule, VCAM, are now accessible to the flowing blood, and you start getting adherence of red blood cells, you start getting adherence of white blood cells. And then they'll say accumulation of lipids within the intima. Well, what happens is you're forming clots on the surface of the artery, and then it gets covered up by the endothelial precursor cells, the circulating endothelial precursor cells, EPCs. Okay? And then, uh, like I said, the MPO being attached to the wall, it causes an inflammatory response. That's why meat eaters have higher white blood cell counts than new vegans, low-fat vegans. Okay, so you get recruitment of leukocytes, white blood cells, to the vessel wall. Yep. Then you get formation of foam cells. Yeah, as you form the clot, the macrophages reabsorb the clot, including the lipids from it, you know, from the plasma membrane to the red blood cells. And then you also basically, it's a clot is a, is a hematoma, like a small hematoma. And then the immune system reabsorbs it and lays down some collagen. So there's deposition of extracellular matrix. So they have told you some of the steps in forming an atherosclerotic plaque, but they have not correctly explained them. <clears throat> so they leave you in confusion. They're not able to put it into a convenient, uh, coherent narrative that makes sense, a sequential description of events. They can tell you events, but they can't explain the cause. And they're never going to come right out and say, gee, high fat diets, high sodium diets, all this processed food, all these estrogenic chemicals, they make you fat sick and atherosclerotic and hypertensive and diabetic. Okay, uh, another component. Atherosclerosis in, involves inflammation at every stage. And then there's elevated CRP, C-reactive protein, and fibrinogen. That's a tricky statement. The reason I got into this is this is a little bit of what I would call a drug dealer statement because there's a big push at Harvard to do research on atherosclerosis saying that inflammation is a major component of it. And I believe, you know, one of the reasons for that push is because you can sell a lot of drugs. Everybody knows high cholesterol is related to atherosclerosis. Well, then you can sell lipid-lowering drugs. Um, but they also, if you can say it's due to inflammation, then you can also sell anti-inflammatory drugs for the treatment of atherosclerosis. But I can tell you, you know, I looked at, I talked to Dr. Sloop, the greatest pathologist, atherosclerosis researcher in the world, and he says he doesn't see significant inflammation in atherosclerotic plaques. He just sees a resorbing hematoma. Um, and he says elevated C-reactor protein in the blood he believes it's a myokine that the muscles can't replace their glycogen because of the insulin resistance, and the glucose can't get into the muscle, so it can't rebuild up its glycogen stores. And he says that's what causes elevated C-reactive protein. And fibrinogen is also elevated because there's inflammation in the blood related to postprandial endotoxemia, for example, and that can lead to amyloid clotting, like the work of Douglas Kell and Aphthoresia Pretoris. So the bottom line is, you know, Esselstyn, he didn't 
use anti-inflammatory drugs to, to cure atherosclerosis. He just put the people on a low-fat diet with no oils. And there is some truth to the statement, well, that reduces inflammation because you avoid the meats, you avoid the oils. Yes, that's true. So it is true that there is a little bit of inflammation. And I know I don't want to get into all the subtle details of you know how much inflammation is there really in obese um, adipose tissue, for example. But I think you see what I'm saying is the elephant in the room is totally ignored, the high-fat diets, okay? And then all this minutia is emphasized. Okay, uh, here's another statement. Pathology of PAD, peripheral arterial disease, that just means atherosclerosis in the legs, is identical to CAD, coronary artery disease. And the major risk factors are tobacco, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and hypertension. So they say hyperlipidemia, but they don't come right out and clearly say you know, mainly due to high fat diets and high fructose in the form of uh, high fructose corn syrup and, and all those things. Okay, and oils. Okay, uh, one more line here. This will be the last line of this um, book review. Elevated serum LDL cholesterol may persist for many reasons, including a high fat diet. And that's the only time I saw that I noticed in the book a um, high fat diet. There was no, no, the word vegan was not mentioned in the entire book that I'm aware of. Um, there was nothing about, like I said, all these vegan diet pioneers. Okay, then he continues. Lifestyle modifications that might be beneficial include maintenance of a healthy diet. No description of diet, just says a healthy diet. What, what does that mean? Okay, that's a BS statement. And weight, a healthy weight, and augmented physical activity. How about saying an exercise? Okay, however, even intensive lifestyle modification. Note these words. This is a big sentence here. Even intensive lifestyle modification is rarely sufficient to prevent cardiovascular events in individuals with long-established atherosclerosis risk factors. Hence, many individuals require pharmacologic agents to optimize cardiovascular outcomes. Okay, so you hear what he's basically saying. He says, you know, it doesn't matter what the patient does. Even lifestyle intensive modifications is rarely sufficient to prevent cardi CV events. So you're going to have to take the drugs is what he's basically saying. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is, yeah, the guy's real smart. Yeah, he's got all kinds of sophisticated discussion of EKG, sophisticated discussion of echocardiography, uh, um, uh, cardiac valve disease, and all these complex topics. But he basically, you know, is out to lunch and missed all the main points about the things that are relevant to most people. He does say that atherosclerosis it causes the majority of death, and he uses the word in developed nations. They don't want to say Western nations. In developed nations, okay? And uh, so the book's a bit of a joke, okay? Yes, you can look up a lot of advanced, sophisticated uh, cardiology knowledge in this book, but it doesn't get to the main point. Eat a low-fat, low-sodium, vegan diet with no oils, and you can cure coronary artery disease. You can cure hypertension before you start having irreversible damage to the arteries, calcifications of the arterial walls, loss of the Winkessel effect. You can cure type 2 diabetes before you've lost a pancreatic beta cell function. So um, anyways, this is conventional medicine. This is the pinnacle, the top, the best that conventional medicine can offer. And it's still a joke.